All right, how you doing? So um, after working a little bit with uh, making some measurements and talking about density and mass, uh, I discovered that we really need to look at making measurements in science. So this presentation will help us better understand the different kind of measurements that we'll be making in class. So first we need to talk about the set of units that are used by scientists. And it's called the SI unit system. It's what all scientists use when they're doing experiments or uh, presenting their findings from those experiments. And it's mostly based on the metric system. So the question is, why would scientists use uh, one standard set of units? Well, there are a few reasons. One of the biggest reasons is so that they can work together. They also need to be able to reproduce experiments and uh, get the same results. So if one scientist were working with, let's say, meters, and the other was working with feet, uh, there's a slight difference there. And this is going to make sure that uh, all experiments can be reproduced. It's just important that everyone is speaking the same language when they're sharing their work with other people. And the best reason for me it's easier. So a lot of you are probably sitting there asking, well, how can this be easier? I don't, I don't know what a meter is. I know what a yard is. Well, let's take a look at two different scenarios here. In the metric system, if we want to convert something like, let's say, 3.12 kilometers to meters, it's pretty simple. There are a thousand meters in one kilometer, so all I need to do is move that decimal point over three spaces, and I end up with 3,120 meters. Now, if we look at the standard system that we use, let's say we want to change 3.12 might be too difficult, so let's try something simpler. Let's convert three miles to feet. Now, remember when we did the metric system, I just had to move the decimal point. With this standard system, it's not quite as easy. So there are 5,280 feet per mile. Try to move that decimal place now. So you have to go and calculate this. So if we do the math right, let me get my calculator. OK, let me get my slide rule. All right, let me get my eraser. OK, all right, I got it. It's 15,840 feet. That was a pain. The standard system isn't based on anything that's simple. It's based on fractions, really. Uh, and like originally, a foot was defined as the length of the king's foot. Well, guess what? The king died, and you had a new king. So you had a new foot. So it's just kind of confusing. I mean, we do have a standard foot now, but it's not as easy as using something that's based on tens, okay? All we need to do with the metric system is move the decimal point around. It's a lot easier to do that than to do that messy math that we had to do with the standard system. So let's get rid of that. So in the metric system, like we said earlier, it's all based on multiples of 10. And we have these prefixes. So all we need to do is add these prefixes to the, the base unit. So like a meter is the base unit for length, or the liter is the base unit for volume. All we have to do is add these prefixes to that base unit, and then we know what we have. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the, the real important ones that we have here that we'll be using are kilo, which means 1,000. The base unit, obviously, which is one. So what I mean by the base unit is that, you know, a meter or a liter or a gram, things like that. And centi means one one hundredth. So we're all familiar with centimeters. That just means it's one one hundredth of a meter. And then a millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter. So some other kind of fun ones that you might want to think about knowing is giga, which means one billion. So a gigameter would be one billion meters. There's a mega, which is a million. Micro, which is one millionth. And nano, which is one billionth. Now you've probably heard, of, heard those in places before. 
like uh, if anyone knows anything about computers, you've heard of a gigabyte. Okay, and a, so a gigabyte is just a billion bytes, and a megabyte would be a million bytes. Some of you that may really be into computers may know what a kilobyte is. Uh, I know things don't come in kilobytes anymore, but a kilobyte is a thousand bytes. And micro, one one millionth, like we said. So I'm sure some of you have heard of nanotechnology. That just means it's there are things that are built on the scale of one billionth of a meter. That's some pretty small stuff. So let's take a look at some of the things we'll be measuring. First, we'll look at distance. So the base unit for distance, like we have said earlier, is meter. So one meter is the base unit. Now, like I said with the uh, standard system that we use, where the king's foot used to be the, the standard that we use to measure distance, the king's foot would change. Every new king would have a new foot size. But with the meter, the meter is defined as one ten millionth of the distance from the equator to the pole. That doesn't change. There are other variations of this, like we had said, and all we need to do is plug in some of those prefixes that we had just mentioned. So I'm sure you've heard of centimeter or millimeter or kilometer. Okay, so a centimeter would be one one hundredth of a meter. Millimeter would be one one thousandth of a meter. And a kilometer would be one thousand meters. Now it's important that we know what tool we have to use to measure distance. And I'm sure most of you know we use a meter stick. And you can see in this picture here, this meter stick is broken up into a hundred parts. So each one of those numbers represents one one hundredth of a meter or a centimeter. The next measurement we'll look at is mass. So mass is the measurement of how much matter an object contains. And like we looked at in the gizmo, this doesn't change no matter where we are because objects do not lose matter. So the base unit for mass is a gram. And a gram is defined as the amount of matter in one cubic centimeter of pure water or one milliliter of pure water. So the mass of that tiny little cube of water is equal to one gram. So again, we have other variations. Just by plugging in those prefixes, like milli, so we have milligrams, I'm sure you, most of you have heard of that, and kilograms. So a milligram would be one one thousandth of a gram, and a kilogram would be one thousand grams. And the tool that we use to measure mass is the triple beam balance. We'll spend some time working in class with these. Another measurement we're going to look at is weight. Now weight is a measurement of the force of gravity on an object. And the base unit for weight is a Newton. The abbreviation for that is a capital N. And a gram is defined as the amount of force you need to accelerate one kilogram of matter one meter per second. Doesn't quite make sense yet, but I think once we get into uh, acceleration and forces in motion, uh, you'll understand that a little better. And the tool that we use for weight is called a spring scale. Okay, that picture is what you, we're probably going to be using quite a bit in class, but spring scales aren't as uncommon as you would think. If you've been to the grocery store, the things that you put your your food in to sort of find their weight is a spring scale. So you put your food in that little pan and it pulls a spring and that's how that little dial moves. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the bathroom scale. That works with a spring as well. You step on the scale and it compresses a spring a certain amount and depending on how much that spring is compressed that's how much the little dial moves and tells you what your weight is. And the last thing we're going to talk about is volume. So volume is a measurement of how much space an object takes up. The base unit for volume is a liter. So a liter is defined as the amount of space taken up by one kilogram of water. 
Now, a lot like when we talked about uh, mass, where one gram was equal to one cubic centimeter of water, a liter is the amount of space taken up by one kilogram of water. So water plays a big role in the metric system. Now, other variations of the liter are a milliliter, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and a cubic centimeter. Now, that sounds a little weird because we're talking about liters, but a cubic centimeter is the unit that's used when you measure uh, regular, regularly shaped objects. So when you, mul when you do the math, you end up multiplying centimeter times centimeter times centimeter, and you end up with a unit of cubic centimeters. And we'll talk about that in the next frame. But before that, we need to talk about the tool used for measuring volume. And the tool used is, well, there isn't really one tool. So let's take a look at different ways we can measure volume. So if we're talking about measuring the volume of regularly shaped objects, we can use the tool of math. So here are some regularly shaped objects, like a cylinder or a sphere or cone, rectangular solids, and then that weird looking bagel thing there. It's called a torus. And there are plenty others, like pyramids and uh, all sorts. I'm sure you can figure some out. Ooh, how about a dodecahedron? So to find the volumes of these kinds of things, we just need to use formulas. So here's a formula for cylinder and a sphere. There's a cone and there's a torus, and they look pretty confusing. Uh, I don't think you have to worry too much. We probably won't use cone and torus and too many others. We may slip the cylinder and sphere one in there here and there, but the one we'll be using most of all is the formula for a rectangular solid, and that you're probably familiar with. The volume is found by multiplying the length, height, and width of the solid. So when you do that, you're actually multiplying measurements of centimeter times centimeter times centimeter, and that's how you end up with centimeters cubed. So on your graphic organizer, there is a diagram there for you to take a look at, and what I'd like you to do is to do the math and figure out the volume of that rectangular solid on your graphic organizer. Now, what do you do if you have an irregularly shaped object? We do need to use tools for this. So let's say you had a rock, okay? And imagine that rock is small enough to fit into a graduated cylinder. What we have to do is we take that rock and put it in there. So let's go through the process here. First thing we need to do is put some water in the graduated cylinder. And the next thing we should do is measure the amount of water that we put in there. Then you carefully take that rock and put it in there, okay? If you drop it in there real fast, you're going to splash and lose some water, so be careful when you do that. So you notice when I put the rock in there, the water level went up. So we need to now measure the new water level. Now we do some simple math. We just subtract the first measurement from the second. So what happened here is when we put the rock in, it displaced some of that water and made the water level rise. And this method of finding volume is called displacement. And there are other ways to do this as well. Imagine we've got a rock that's too big to fit in a graduated cylinder. Well, they have these things called overflow cups. And the way this works is you fill up the overflow cup with water until a little bit of water starts to drip out of the spout. And then you place a graduated cylinder underneath the spout. And when you carefully place the rock in, the water level rises, and that water pours into the graduated cylinder. Now all you need to do is measure the amount of water in the graduated cylinder, and the volume of that water is the water that was displaced by the rock. So that's the volume of your rock. So on your graphic organizer, I've given you some line spaces there, and I'm asking you to describe how to find the volume of an irregularly shaped object. And I want you to pick one of the two methods we just talked about and write a short paragraph about how to do that.